I pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And we're saying that last I did my Savior bleed, I did my sorrow die.
good song. But drops of grief can never pay the debt of love I owe. Here, Lord, I give myself away. Tis all that I can do. Well, this morning I've got kind of an unusual sermon. And I'm glad the kids are not here. Um, really, truly. I was a little concerned about that. And God said, don't worry about it. And sure enough, I didn't have to worry about it. Turn to Proverbs chapter 7. This morning I'm going to preach the tale of two bedspreads. I thought you'd like the title. Tale of Two Bedspreads. Now, if you've read the book of Proverbs at all, you'll understand that chapter 7 is about a young man that didn't do the right thing. He got lured into a temptation. And at the end of the chapter, he pays with his life. And you know what it's about. I don't have to go into great detail. Um... Somebody lures him into temptation and he commits a sin uh, that God said don't do and uh, he, he pays for it. And so, But that's really not what I'm preaching on this morning. Um, look at verse 16, okay? And I'm just going to use a little bit of this. I, I'm, I'm going to type this out. The Bible says uh, this woman that's in this chapter, she says to this man, I have decked my bed with coverings. Of tapestry uh, with card works with fine linen of Egypt. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. All right, now uh, keep your finger there and go to Proverbs 31, just a few chapters down, the last chapter of Proverbs. And we're going to read about another woman. Now, this is a virtuous woman, the Bible says, not like the woman in chapter number seven. The chapter number seven woman is a bad woman. She is an evil woman. Um, she's a woman that you should not emulate, ladies. Um, in chapter 31, you have a good woman, a virtuous one. This lady you ought to copy. Uh, look what it says in verse 22 about this lady. Uh, she maketh herself coverings of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. So, here we have two women, a good woman and a bad woman. Uh, and both of them have coverings that are like tapestry. Now, what is a tapestry? Well, a tapestry basically is a, a rug that you hang up on the wall. And uh, they're very intricate, a lot of the old-timey old ones. Uh, sometimes they'd show historical scenes or uh, some, sometimes they'd tell family histories. Um the very old ones, like from the Middle Ages, are, are worth tons of money. Uh, the Persians were real good at this kind of stuff. And uh, people would, uh, when the, the Middle East opened up, and the uh, Crusades, and the Renaissance, they'd bring these uh, rich-looking tapestries from Persia. And that's where we got Persian rugs. Um, the world often imitates God's stuff. Did you know that? It likes to imitate. Now... The woman in chapter 7, she's a type of a religion. And, and various religions fit into her mold. And the woman in cha chapter 31 is a type of the church of the living God. Okay? And I'm going to look at these two beds. They're, they're covered with similar things. One's covered in purple and and, and, and uh, scarlet, and the other one is covered in, in uh, carved things from Egypt and has all kinds of perfume and spices and junk on it. Now, um, by way of introduction, I want to talk about bedding um, or, or, or bed clothes or bed linen, as they're referred to. Um, this usually does not include the mattress. Now, the mattress has had a... a Various and odd history through history. Uh, a lot of people throughout history would just, uh, they'd go to the barn, find them some clean straw. They'd stick it on a bed and cover it with a sheet, kind of wrap it up in a bundle, and that was their bed for the night. Uh, sometimes they had pillows and sometimes they didn't. Um, the, the Egyptians, I think, were the ones that invented the uh, strap-type bed uh, that you still see in some... Uh, uh, cots and things, uh, they would uh, they would make make kind of a 
a four post frame that had some legs to it, just like that, see? And then they would uh, take pieces of leather, and they were pretty stout pieces of leather, and they would put them one that way, and then they would cross hatch them like a basket and go the other way and kind of hang them on these uh, boards around the frame. And that was bad. And that was, you cover that with some uh, uh, blankets and, uh, you know, maybe, maybe some. Uh, something a little more comfortable, and that wasn't too bad of a bit. Um, for a long time, especially in the 1700s, they thought sitting up in bed was the way to sleep, which is weird. You go into some of these old old uh, forts and things and look at some of the beds from the 17 and early 1800s, and the beds are only, only that long. And you think, well, how can you sleep in that bed? You sleep cross by? No, they sit, sit, sitting up. And that's why they had the big headboards and things. They'd put a pillow in the back and they'd sleep. Um, so, so I'm not talking about the mattress per, per se. Um, mattresses have always been prone to... Uh, if you go out to the barn and you get some hay, you may think it's clean. You're probably going to bring back some bugs or something. Doesn't really sound wonderful that I want to lay in. Uh, but, but the Americans... Um, uh, you know, they brought the British traditions over. Sometimes bedspreads, we call them bedspreads in this country, uh, they're used for decoration. Uh, they take them off and they put them back on. Uh, people go to great lengths. I remember when we got married, we bought drapes of a certain color and the bedspread was of the same color and the, the, the things for the, uh, the, the top pillows all had little things going around them, you know, and you take them off at night and sleep in them, put them back in the morning. Uh, eventually, the longer you got married, you, it, it, the day came when, why are we fiddling with this? <laughs> We're the only ones in here. So, uh, I mean, we, we, we pull up the bed in the morning and that's about all we're going to do. Uh, now, some people, they change their linens and things every day and wash them. Some people, you know, wait uh, weeks. I, I know some people that hardly ever change them. Uh, but the blanket or quilt or duvet uh, goes back to about 3500 BC in Egypt. Uh, bedding's a big business. You go to Walmart and they have two or three rows of, of beddings. They have a whole row of pillows. They have a whole row of uh, sheets and pillowcases. And then I got another one of blankets and, and, and uh, duvets and coverlets and quilts and all kinds of things. Uh, people will look for thread counts and, oh, the mattress ads on TV. Um, you would think Americans don't get any sleep at all if they don't have the right mattress or mattress cover or pillow or pillow case or... My, if you tire enough, you won't sleep, darling. Your ancestors didn't have all that stuff and they slept. God looks at the person when he looks at you at night, he protects you. He don't care about your sheets. Uh, did you know, now this is interesting, there's five different charts used worldwide of the size of sheets and beds. So you go over to Afghanistan or China and you probably can't find the same sheets that you find out at your Walmart. And I... I've seen some of those that accidentally got shipped in. I heard a guy in there complaining, and the lady looked on the back and said, oh, we were not supposed to have this. This was shipped by accident to us. And he was going to he can get it fit on his bed for love and money. And it was supposed to be queen size. And it was too small. And it come to find out it was from another country. So, tale of two bedspreads. I'm going to look at these two, two women and their bedspreads. I want to look at the bad woman first. The bad woman's covering, okay? The world wants you to come to them. The worldly devilish religions want to get you sucked in like this young man in chapter 7. They don't want you to worship God. This woman in chapter 7, she had no intention of doing anything that was right or good. She was cheating on her husband. She was trying to get this young man involved in a sin. And the world does that with God's things. Uh, you go to some churches, they believe in Christ, a Christ, maybe not our Christ. 
Uh, they, they believe in a death and burial and resurrection. Some of them do, some of them don't. But they have all kinds of rituals and they have all things that they don't believe. Like take Jehovah's Witness. If Jehovah's Witness came in here, he'd freak out because we got flags in our church. They don't believe in flags. You go to Church of Christ, they don't believe in pianos or guitars or stuff. Uh, you know, it's just goofy what the devil tries to come up with and suck people in. And he does a very good job of it. That's what this woman's a type of, is a false religion. Notice that this tapestry on her bed was basically for show. She's in it for show, man. She's not in it to uh, be, th this wasn't for comfort. This wasn't to keep her uh, warm. This wasn't to do anything but to show off this bed spread and all these carvings and junk that she had. We go to visit a relative, uh, I won't mention the city, but it starts with a B and ends with a ham. And, <laughs> and we go and visit every Christmas, uh, or used to, and we don't go as often as we do, used to. Um, but I, m I remember, remember the first time I went up there, and then said, your bedroom's up the stairs and to the left. I went in there, and half the bed is full of pillows. And so I jump in the bed, and I'm just, no, no, no. Don't lay on those pillows. Those are just for show. So every night to go to bed, we had to take all these pillows and fill the corner up with pillows. Why? <laughs> what made me mad is the cat got up on the bed. They didn't shoot the cat away from the pillows. I ain't as good as a cat. It's for show. For show, for show, for show. You don't find no pillows on the other stuff. For show. Revelation. Chapter 17, verse 4, talks about a woman. He said, So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman set upon a scarlet beast, full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color, decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand, full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. It's mystery Babylon. It's the, it's the coming religion. One of these days we're going to have a religion run by the Antichrist. There's going to be a, there's going to be an economic Babylon and a religious Babylon and, 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 and several other kinds of influences the Antichrist is going to have. And, and he's going to be the best showman in the world. According to the New York Times in the summer of 1994, a Virginia State trooper who was a member of the bomb squad and his dog, Master Blaster, uh, became local celebrities when they found uh, a bomb at malls in Hampton and uh, Virginia Beach, Virginia. Uh, that bit of celebrity evidently went to the state trooper's head. A hidden camera later recorded him placing a bomb in a shed that he had been asked to search for explosives. He was arrested and later pled guilty in planting explosive at the two malls, a courthouse and a coliseum. He told investigators he had not intended to hurt anybody. The bombs were just cardboard tubes filled with uh, explosive with no definite detonators and pipes full of gunpowder and nails and they never were meant to explode. He simply wanted to enhance his image as a bomb sniffer troop. You see, there's always been bad people in places. You have to be careful. Uh, that guy, he was worthless as a cop. He didn't care about helping people. He just cared about himself. These religions make people selfish. You look at some of these things and, 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 and all they do is look inward, inward. Now, that's not a bad thing. You should look inward as a Christian and confess your sins. But you look inward and then you look upward to God. That's what you should do. That's true religion. No show. Um, it had a lot of this, this bedspread of this bad woman. Had a lot of fakery and razzle-dazzle to distract from the sinful situation they were in. Look, chapter 7 in Proverbs is very plain what it says, and what's going on. All you got to do is read it, and you can tell what's going on. You don't have to guess at it. 
there's some immorality going on there. But at the end, you know what happens? The guy pays with his life. Now you go to some of these uh, uh, pornographic magazines and, and the news media, and they try to dress that stuff up and, and tell you it's okay and, and everything's going to be all right. No, it's not. The Bible tells you the truth about it. It's the only book that really does. It doesn't dress it up. I mean, I've, I've read some of these books and, uh, you know, you've got people that aren't married and they're messing around by the end of the book, you know, and they cover it up by the end because they fall in love and they go away together. <sighs> That's just a bunch of razzle-dazzle. Real love doesn't do that. Men, if you love your wife, you'll respect her before you're married and after you're married. There's no razzle-dazzle. Sinful, and, and the world's good at covering up sinful situations. Uh, I had to stop for gas in, what was it, Gulfport or one of those cities over there in Mississippi where they have gambling. And I, I stopped at this gas station and I had to use the bathroom. And so I went up to the counter and the guy says, you have to go through there. And I looked there and it said, Casino. And I had to walk through a casino to use the bathroom. I had to go bad. I couldn't wait till the next exit. It was educational. Those machines, they're not painted black or gray or industrial colors. They're all decked out in gold and red and blinking lights. And, and boy, they look pretty. And Because they want you to go up there and waste your money. <laughs> and they don't have some ugly guy... At the blackjack table, they got some beautiful gal all decked out, you know, looking good, and she's passing out the cards. That's the way the devil operates, folks. He dresses up thin, and, 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 and you know, he's got little decorations. This, this gal had carvings from Egypt and had them put on the bed. And, and you know what? Some of the tabernacle used carvings for God. Uh, there's always an imitation that the devil has of God's thing. You go to most most big churches, they'll sing some hymns, they'll uh, they'll take it off, and, and you think, well, okay, I'm in a Christian church. And then the guy opens his mouth and he starts to preach. Remember the old guy named R.W. Sham, Shambach on the radio? R.W. Shambach, he was a good preacher. He really was. About seven-eighths of his sermon, you were amen, and you were saying, oh, that's good stuff. And then he'd get down to the last eighth of a sermon, he'd start, he'd go take a left field and run out into the country somewhere. Biblically. And I thought, how can a guy get so messed up preaching that good? But that's, that, that's the way the devil operated. He was deceived. These, these carvings, you have to... That, this is why we don't have any statues or pictures of Jesus. I saw something on the internet. Uh, ancient painting of Jesus found in Judea. How do they know it's Jesus? I mean, everybody looked a, a lot alike back in those days. How do they know it's Jesus? Does it say Jesus on the back of it or something? I, you know, you got me. Uh, the devil try to try to get you off the, off the track. And notice that the stuff that she had was from Egypt. Egypt. Now, when the children of Israel got to the promised land, they had a problem. They brought some of Egypt with them, some of them. Ezekiel 27.7 talks about Egypt, fine linen and embroidered work from Egypt was that which thou spreadest forth to be thy sail, blue and purple from the islands of uh, Islasha, that was uh, which covered thee. Now, so in Ezekiel's day, they had all this stuff that was being imported from Egypt. Uh, in Judges, you find a guy. And he, he decides that he doesn't want to go down to the temple. He's going to set up something at his house. His name was Micah. 
And it says these went to Micah's house and fetched the carved images and the ephod and the teraphim and the molten images. Then the priest said to them, what do ye? So one day uh, a bunch of army people that were going up to Dan, they came by and said, oh, we like this setup. We're going to steal it. And they stole his religion from him. You know what? You can't steal my religion. You know where my religion is? Down in my heart. My temple's in there. So this woman had sinful behavior and sinful behavior never brings rest and peace. She fooled this guy into, into her bed and he didn't get no rest. He ended up dead. Jealous husband. There was a um, native evangelist, an overseer of an African church years ago, and he, and he talked about following the right path and the right path only. It was nighttime and the crowd of natives sat around the campfire and listened to this man preach. A native dog passed between the fire and the listeners and the preacher. And the preacher suddenly said, look at the dog. And everybody looked at this dog. And he said, how many legs has it? And one guy said, four. And the preacher said, yes, four, four legs indeed. But have you ever seen a dog with four legs trying to follow more than one path? Like two legs go that way and two legs. And they all laughed and, and had a good joke. He said, no. Two sets of legs follow the other two sets of legs and they go down the same path. He said, you need to stay on the right path. You cannot serve God and mammon. Beware of the world and its, its fakery and its razzle-dazzle because it's from Egypt and God don't like Egypt. This is really a simple sermon. The devil fake stuff. Let's look at the good woman. The good woman. The good woman. She's a type of the church. And her coverings are good coverings. They're, they're for her husband and for her bed and, and what they do. Uh, turn to Hebrews chapter 13 verse 4. Let's look what the Bible says about something the home should be. And I hope home, your home is this way. And, and it, it has to do with more than just... Um, what happens in the bedroom, by the way. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4. And it says this. We'll read down to the colon. Marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. Notice that, that it talks about the bed. Now, the bed is a symbol. A symbol of a communion between man and wife. A symbol of rest between man and wife, a, a, a symbol, look, when you go to bed at night, you close your eyes and, and you know, you, you're not going to do anything. You're not going to, you're not watching for people that's going to harm you. You're not up fixing supper. Uh, you're not, all you're doing is just laying there and you're really vulnerable. And so believers since time immemorial have laid their head down on their pillow at night like David said in the Psalms, and they trust the Lord at night. Every night before we go to bed, we ask, we pray. We pray for y'all. We pray for Miss Carol. We pray for Dee. We pray for uh, Brother Mike. And we, we, and, and, and we ask God to help us uh, that night and help us get some rest and protect us. And protect our house and our yard and our stuff. Because we're going to be out of it for eight hours. And it's nice to crawl into a nice bed with a nice covering, especially in the wintertime. You snuggle down on those seats and get the, get the covers all up in your, you know. When I was younger, I used to wrap my head in the covers. My head got cold. I don't do that no more. I, I, we switch places. I, I get hot and she gets cold. Now, she used to get hot and I used to get cold. But, but it's, it's a place that's honorable. It's a place that's undefiled. Look, God gave us marriage. God gave us the home. God gave us our relationship with our wife and our children. And, and there's nothing evil or wicked about it. God gave us a place. And, and you say, well, God has nothing to do with the bedroom. Who told you that? 
You ought to pray over everything in your life. Everything. You ought to pray when you go to bed. You ought to pray when you get up from bed. You ought to pray over your meals and thank God. You ought to pray when you get in your... Look, if you don't pray when you get in that car or truck, you're foolish. Have you seen the way people drive? It's not me I'm worried about. It's all the other goofy people. I saw some bicyclists. Uh, I don't mind if they use the bike lane, but some of them get on there and there ain't no bike lane, there ain't no shoulder, there ain't no nothing. And they're, they're trying to ride on that little white line and like, oh, no, here comes this other car just zoom right past them. Thinking, one of these days, they ain't going to make it. I hope that guy prayed before he got on that bicycle. I hope you pray before you go anywhere. I hope you pray when you get home. Pray. Because God made the home... That's one of his blessings for all mankind. You don't have to be Christian to have a good home. I know plenty of lost people have a good home. You know what's wrong with us nowadays? We want to go against the instincts that God puts in us as human beings. God meant for man and woman to get together. That's what he meant to happen. All this other stuff, God didn't ordain and God's not in it. That's why this young man in Hebrews got, the, got it in the neck. Well, actually, it wasn't his neck, but you have to fight that stuff. And you have to, because the, the, flesh, the flesh wants something to, see, it, it thinks because it's forbidden, it thinks it's, it, it's you know, it's going to be, it's going to be so much more fun or something. Well, don't believe the flesh. Don't believe the devil. Don't believe the... Look, they have to use... They have to use sex to sell everything. What in the world does it have to do with buying a car? Or fixing, fixing supper? Or, you know, I mean, it has nothing to do with some of that stuff. Yet, that's what the world uses to, 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 to dangle out in front of people. Yeah. It's worked good with cigarettes. I haven't figured out how to do marijuana yet. It's 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 hard to be appealing when you're all doped, <laughs> all doped out. <laughs> it's kind of funny. I just find that funny. Hey man, you know, well, the type of the church. I bet you that this woman in Proverbs 22, not only was it an original cover, but the Bible says the Bible says it was made of silk. It was soft and simple. I like to keep things simple in the church. You pull out a hymn book, you sing a song, you pray, you take an offering, or you don't. You get up and hear the preaching of the Word of God, you go home. You come to prayer meeting, and guess what? You pray. It's very simple around here. Now, we've added this little gizmo. Now, now this morning, you weren't here. The computer wouldn't come on. So I think, I think oh, well, we ain't got videos today. But we prayed over it, and God made the thing come on. If God wants it, if God's in it, it'll be there, and it'll be simple. You can make anything too complicated. I mean, you go to some churches. I was raised in a Lutheran church, and we got up and we got down, and we got, you know, we 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 droned on with, you know, come the Lord, let's come in my presence, you know, and I'm glad I don't do that no more. I look back and say, really, they thought that was of God. Now maybe back in Luther's day that was great stuff, but nowadays no. Tough is not the same as hard. This lady in Proverbs 20, you read, and she's a tough lady. She, she, has got, she has got her armor on, and she's fighting the good fight. But on an emotional level, she's soft to her loved ones. I've met some people that way. Lord have mercy, don't mess with their youngins. You'll get your head took off verbally. 
And they're tough. They go out and fight for their family. They, they go out and get the best for their family. And, and nothing's too good for their kids. That, that's, a biblical, that's a biblical thing. Yet when you see them deal with their kids, they're, they're soft and loving. Yeah, they have to discipline their kids. But you know, you give your kid enough love and you, you show them where the boundaries are. And usually kids respond to that. That's what's wrong with kids nowadays. Their parents don't even love them. I would try to prove that, but I just don't feel like it. Ezekiel 16 says I close, talks about a, a, a baby that was found in, in, in a field. And, and God likens Israel to this baby he took and he cleaned it up and he raised this baby and, and it became a young woman. And God said of Israel, it said, I clothed thee also with broidered work and shod thee with badger skin and girded thee about with fine linen and clothed thee with silk. God wants to dress his church up. God's not interested in a shabby church. That's why I tried to make all the roofs red. And, and clad the buildings all in the same kind of siding and color. And I have somebody come by and we mow the grass regularly. And we try to keep the... And I, and I hire people to make professional looking signs rather than paint them by hand like I used to. And, and because, because we've got a lot to compete against in the world. So the least we can do is, is make it simple and easy looking and good on the eye. You ought to be proud of your, your wife, man. And, and I don't care what she looks like. Um, but but you, ought to, you ought to treat her good. You ought to make sure she has the, the clothes that she needs and, and, and the stuff that she needs. Look, if she needs a pan to cook with your... If she needs a pan to cook your dinner in the kitchen, you ought to at least think enough of to get her the right kind of pan. God let me say that. I don't know if we've got a pan problem or not in the church. This woman here, her husband, you read that chapter of Proverbs 31, her husband treats her good, like a queen. And you know, God one day is going to crown us. We're going to get crowns. And we're going to stand before the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and we're going to be his bride. Does, does that sink into you? That means we're the queen. What a blessing. What a blessing. You know what this lady in Proverbs 31 has? She's got a good life. A righteous life. And that always ends up in peace. Inner peace. You want some inner peace? Be a good woman. See, it's no mistake that I got one man and all you women preaching to you. Don't be a bad woman. I don't think I got any bad women in here. Look, if there's anybody out there that's a bad woman, quit being a bad woman. You're hurting people. This woman in chapter 7 hurt people. Good, godly, Christian women don't want to hurt people. They want, they want to be a blessing to people. Dr. Joseph Henry said that during World War II, two physics graduate students heard a professor say that someday... A method would be devised for polishing glass that would replace steel as the flattest surface known to man. When this was done, a revolution in technology would take place. After graduation, these two young physicists formed a partnership and set out to prove their professor's theory. They established a laboratory and went to work. Several years later, after a very complicated process, they made a great giant breakthrough in the process. They produced such a flat surface that it could be used to measure objects within two millionths of an inch. A great development over anything that was previously developed. When Dr. Henry visited their plant, uh, one of the owners said to him, see these two squares of glass? And he picked them up uh, and he put them together and he said, they have been put through this new process. I want to show you something. And like I said, he put the two pieces of glass together and he handed them to Dr. Henry. 
And he said, now take them apart. Dr. Henry tugged and he 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 couldn't get them apart. And he twisted and he couldn't get in budge. And the other young physicist explains says the two surfaces uh, are held together by certain points of contact. Ordinarily, there are so few points of contact in any surface microscopically that they come apart very easily. Says the points on these two pieces of glass, however, have been ground down until they're almost identically the same flat surface, and they're being held together by so many little points of contact that they're almost impossible to get apart. Let me tell you something. When a man and a woman get married, they should fit like that. They should. And, and if you let God in your marriage and God control you, you'll fit like that. Oh, yeah, you'll have disagreements. Oh, yeah, problems will come and problems will go. But God always rewards folks that do right and try to do the right thing. See, we live in a country that suddenly believes that two wrongs make a right, and they don't. They don't. And if we believe the advertisements on television, we have a hard time getting rest as a nation. Because there's sure a lot of stuff for sale to get people to sleep. Some blame stress of modern life. Some blame the invention of the electric lighting or the gas lighting before that. You know what God blames on you not getting rest? Sin. That's what God blames. You say, well, I'm in pain. Well, well all those things in your body are, are caused by, because Adam sinned in the garden one day. We wouldn't have all those aches and pains and stuff. If Adam just hadn't eaten that fruit. Thank you, Adam. Not. You know what the solution is? Well, turn to James 3. James 3. The Bible says in Proverbs 13, the way of the transgressor is hard. James 3, 17. I want to tell you what God says about peace. When you go to bed at night, you should have peace. You should lay your head down on your pillow. And look, it, 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 you know, I wear one of these uh, breathing machines at night because I got Snoring, my goozle don't work right. I snore. She wears one too. You know, and, and I take I take some pain meds for a go to. You know, I'm, I'm taking care of the physical stuff. And and if I'm awake at night, I'm not awake because I'm worried about something. I'm I'm awake because the cat's pounced on me. And wants me to get up. And wants some food or or you know I've got to use the the bathroom or something like that. But when I sleep, I sleep like a log because I got peace in my heart. James 3.17 But the wisdom that is from above is first pure. You got that? Pure. Then peaceable, gentle, easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy, and the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Not the lady in Proverbs 17. It's not about her. It's about the lady in Proverbs 31. Then Jesus said this in Matthew 11, 28. I said Jesus is the solution. He said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart. And ye shall find rest to your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. If you got problems with peace, you need to go to Jesus. While I was making this sermon, I had a choir thing playing in the back. And it's amazing. I got to this point and I, I got said, listen, listen, listen. And they were singing, All the way my Savior leads me. The third verse is, All the way my Savior leads me. Oh, the fullness of His love. 
Perfect rest to me is promised in my Father's house above. When my spirit clothed thee mortal wings as flight to realms of day, this my song through endless ages, Jesus led me all the way. You know what that verse implies of that song? It implies, oh, Fanny Crosby said, look, you can find peace and you can find rest if you let Jesus lead you and have control of your life. This old young man in, in, in chapter 7 in Proverbs, he wasn't letting God lead his life. He, he, was, he was letting the flesh lead his life. And this woman wasn't thinking about God when she was doing this, what he did, she did. But these people in Proverbs 31, they were thinking of God and what a blessing they could be to their family. And they were trying to love the best they could love. And they were trying to provide the best they could buy. And, and if they were Christians, I guarantee you, they were praying every day and letting Jesus lead them. Now this sermon is, is really about the family. Now I've used the, I've used a metaphor of a bedspread. Because you know a lot of families, you know, like Saturday morning, we, we, we have this picture, thanks to Hollywood, that the kids come romping in and just bounce in the bed and wake poor mom and daddy up or Christmas morning. You know, oh boy, let's go over the presents. But more than not, the bedroom is kind of neutral territory in most houses. It's a place where, where you know, you, you, you go and talk. You go, you go in there to... Uh, be alone. You go. The bedroom's a, a interesting place in American culture. For a Christian, it can be a place of prayer. It can be a place of uh, of trust. It can be a place to take your burdens to Jesus and lay them down on that bed. Sometimes, when me and my wife want to talk about something serious, and we want don't want any distractions, we'll go lay down in the bed and talk. Yeah, we got our clothes on, shoes on, don't matter. We're, we're just there to talk. Sometimes we get great business done laying down in the bed and talking. Because it's kind of like it's, uh, you know, maybe we've had an argument about something or maybe we've had a disagreement about something. And, and you know, just because you argue about it don't mean the situation don't need to be resolved somehow or another. Sometimes important issues need to be talked about. Well, God can get in the, right in the middle of that thing. You know what I did when we got married, Linda? I gave you to God. And you know what you told me you did? You gave me to God. And that's the way our household operates. So you don't ever get mad at your wife, do you? Well, sometimes I do. You know what I do? I go find me a place to get along. I said, God, I gave her to you a long time ago. She's still yours. Do something. Yeah, do something. And, and and sometimes God will say, <coughs> you need to get fixed too there, bud. So, Jesus can lead you in your life. Pray for these people. There's a lot of people that are Proverbs 7 people. A lot of people nowadays. There's whole communities of people that proclaim their goodness, even though they're, what they're doing is clearly labeled as sin in the Bible. Pray for those people. They need prayer. They've messed their life up whether they know it or not. Don't let your life get messed up. And you know, if you trust Jesus, it won't get messed up. Because Jesus can lead you all the way. Heavenly Father, help us now. Lord, I've talked enough this morning. I know it's been a weird sermon. And God, I, 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 this thing fell out of that stack of sermons. And God said, how about that one? And Lord, I didn't know what you was doing. But Lord, I think I do. I think I know that some folks get stressed out. And, and you know, families have been at home now. Kind of locked up with one another. And I'm sure nerves get frayed. And, you know, kids get on people's nerves. And, and they've had to figure out what to do. It's been good for some people, but it's been bad for some people. God, I pray you show us about our home. 
Show us how good a home can be. God, uh, there's people that have lived and died and they look back at their family life when they were children. And God, they write songs like Precious Memories. And God, uh, mo Mother's Bible and, and, and songs about mom and dad, it's a blessing to them. God, nowadays, I, I don't know, there's a lot of families look at their family. I don't think it's a blessing to them, Lord. So help our families in America. And Lord, if there's any families like that here, I pray you help them. Lord, I, I pray they'll find peace and rest. And God, you'll, uh, maybe there's some family members that aren't seeking you. Maybe there's some people that just don't want to trust Jesus. I pray you help them, God. Show them the way. Turn the light on them, Lord, and, and show them what's going on. If this guy in Proverbs 7 had realized what was happening, he would have ran home. If this gal in Proverbs had realized what she was doing, how much hurt she she would have stopped. I'm sure of it. So Lord, help us to do things and do them your way. And let you have a say-so in what we do in our lives. And help the husbands. The husbands aren't here this morning. They're... They're, they're, some of them are way out of town. Some of them are busy working. Uh, some of them are teaching Sunday school in the back. So Lord, help them. Go out and get this message. And give them peace too. God, give us peace at home. God, you said in Corinthians that God called us to peace. And it's talking about the home. So Lord, help us to have peace at home. And give us joy. And God, when we get to our heavenly home, God, can we look back and see that we had that Jesus led us all the way and we, we had some peace and joy and goodness at the home you give us now?